Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome um, to the session with uh, OTT uh, Pay. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to give a, a thank you uh, to Payments Canada uh, for the opportunity to uh, be able to participate at this level uh, in, in their summit, especially with what's essentially the premier uh, payments events uh, uh, in Canada. Um, today, we're going to share uh, the OTT Pay story with you. Um, and share really what's an opportunity uh, that's growing daily uh, in Canada uh, and and uh, uh, and the U.S. And we also wanted to extend a thank you for the audience uh, who are in attendance today. Uh, we know your time is valuable, and uh, again, thanks for investing your, your essentially your lunch time uh, with this. So, what we're going to be covering today is. Um, we're going to talk about tapping into the buying power of a very specific community um, uh, consumer group uh, in Canada uh, and talk about how a merchant uh, can do that, um, tapping into that consumer group, not only here in Canada, but also uh, in, in China as well. But specifically, we're going to talk about um, the QR code as a digital payment method, um, success in the growth of the Chinese mobile payments in Canada and how to market and sell to that community again both here uh, and in canada one quick housekeeping thing to take care of before we begin if you do have any comments or questions uh, please feel free to add them into the uh, uh, chat box uh, we will uh, try and answer as many of the questions uh, as possible or if you prefer in case we don't get to it if you can perhaps just leave your contact information with a question and we'll um, definitely uh, uh, follow up with you uh, post um, post talk today. So let's meet the panel. <clears throat> Excuse me. So my name is Martin McCann. I'm the Chief Growth Officer uh, at OTT Pay. Uh, I'm going to play two roles today. I'm going to be your moderator, but also an active uh, panel participant. Um, you could categorize me as a career uh, payments person. I've been in the industry for, uh, for over 30 years. I've seen everything from the knuckle busters um, back in the day to the uh, first authorization terminals to the migration to this great new technology called draft capture and settlement. That was part of the pilot and then the ultimate launch of Interac, uh, rode the wave of the EMV conversion, both in Canada and the US, contactless implementation and beyond. Uh, I'm, looking, I'm really looking forward to uh, what's coming down the pipeline. Uh, my experience does extend uh, outside of Canada into the US. Uh, I do have global experience in dealing with payments as well in the hardware, software, processing and consulting business. Uh, and I've worked with many of the processors, manufacturers, and card associations and, and startups. Um, Chris McDonald, unfortunately, was, was supposed to be not Chris McDonald, who was supposed to be on the panel today, unfortunately, uh, was feeling a little bit under the weather today uh, and won't be joining us. Uh, but Chris is the senior vice president, uh, product, and head of OTT Pay's e commerce uh, division. Also joining me on the panel uh, is Peter Wang. Peter's our chief technology officer uh, of OTT Financial Group. Uh, Peter is an original employee of OTT Pay, uh, and he runs and deals with both of our R&D and product teams, and he basically manages all the complex projects, customized software applications, product development projects, and the, on, the daunting task of the ongoing requirements of OTT, in fact, being a PCI uh, compliant organization. Uh, Peter's a veteran of the uh, financial software engineering industry. He's had senior management roles at both TD uh, and uh, Citibank. Also joining us today is Timothy Yip, who's our Vice President uh, of Marketing. Um, Timothy is responsible for the marketing of products and services that really supports all the lines of businesses at OTT Financial Group. Uh, Timothy's a seasoned uh, product and marketing executive, and he's got over 20 years experience, uh, both developing uh, and driving product and marketing strategies, uh, specifically in the, in the digital space. He deals with content uh, strategies, digital, social uh, media strategies, branding, communications, and he's held uh, positions as managing director uh, at a full service North American ad agency, senior product and marketing roles at, at, at Canada Post, uh, PC Financial, and, uh, uh, and Scotiabank. So that's kind of who we are. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, OTT Pay. Uh, OTT Pay, uh, we're a proud Canadian company. Uh, we're based uh, in Toronto. We have offices uh, all across Canada, and we're part of the OTT um, Financial Group. Um, you could describe us as a value-add merchant services business. 
Um, we process Visa, we process MasterCard, we process Interact, uh, both in a brick and mortar uh, and e-com environments. But our services truly do go beyond just processing transactions. Uh, they also include highly specialized uh, target market services like the one that we're going to specifically talk about today. So what are we talking about today? Um, basically, what we do is, um, in the context of our conversation today, is we is processing digital payments uh, and offering marketing services to merchant brands, uh, so they can go directly to the uh, consumers in, in China uh, and in, in Canada. So that's the introduction. Let's dive right into uh, right into it. So I think the best place to start is. Uh, why is QR code and QR code based technology and digital payments so important to the to the Chinese consumer? And I think to begin, you have to really look at understanding something that you've probably heard about in the news called WeChat and understanding it as a social program. Um, as a Westerner, one of the first things I learned at uh, when I joined OTT Pay was I had to stop thinking like someone who grew up in the Western payment system. WeChat platform, as I mentioned, is a social platform. And if you think of it as it's an all-encompassing super app, Westerners, we toggle between Facebook, Instagram, um, et cetera, et cetera. That is all captured within what essentially is an internet uh, within China. And what your average Chinese consumer does is they have basically what's an out of bed to back to bed experience. In other words, when they get up in the morning, they log into WeChat and they stay in WeChat all day and it's a pretty well the last thing they look at. Um, and then while you're, while you're within the social program, you're doing obviously social things, but you're also consuming. And then within there, that's where your WeChat page, your Alley page, et cetera, uh, would operate. So if you think about that mindset from a Chinese consumer perspective, um, they want the, the experience. They're experiencing that within China today, and they want to experience that when they come into um, when they come into Canada. So that's driving preference and preferences for this consumer group uh, within within Canada. So if you accept that premise, um, what I would like to do is just talk a little bit about the actual technology that's involved actually in a, in a QR code, um, and I'm going to hand it over to Peter. Uh, to tell us uh, a little bit about how the QR code works, um, what it's going to allow you to do, how the transaction is going to flow, the security around it, and how it settles to the merchant. So, Peter, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Martin, for the introduction. So, um, yeah, OTD Pay is focused focus on the QR code based uh, digital wallet payment. Then, what's a QR code? QR code refers to a quick response code. Uh, it's an update, uh, uh, updated barcode because uh, it's two dimension barcode. Um, so QR code can use uh, not only numeric but also the alphabet numeric special character to store the data. So uh, then the machine can easily read the information contained in the code. Um, compared with the traditional barcode, QR code can store large volume of data. Um, so additionally, it's very safe and faster. So a typical QR code based uh, payment process flow is uh, the user opens, uh, uh, opens their uh, digital wallet uh, payment app. Once the total transaction amount is set in the post system of the retailer, the QR code payment, uh, the app, like a digital wallet, display the QR code, then that identify with the user's uh, wallet details. The retailer then scans the QR code uh, with a scanner, and then, um, then uh, concluding the transaction. Um, the, the benefit of using QR code, um, the First thing is uh, is instant payments. So the one of the biggest uh, advantage of using uh, this uh, QR code based uh, uh, digital payment is that it's facilitating instant payment, making the payment via QR code extreme quick compared to other methods. Because the, the user has uh, the, the user um, 
only required to open their digital wallet, scan the QR code, confirm, and process payment. Within a few seconds, the payment uh, complete. And another uh, uh, big uh, advantage of the QR code, uh, QR code based payment is uh, security. So uh, making payment via QR code uh, based digital wallet is very secure. It's because the QR code is, uh, is nothing but just a, just a tool that is used to exchange the tokenized information. Um, any data which is transferred where QR code is encrypted. So um, it's, uh, it's very secret. Because it's very secret payment system, it's uh, embedded in the customer's smartphone. It requires uh, uh, phone security and the digital wallet security and uh, payment code verification for a larger amount. So it's uh, multiple layers of security on top of the, this payment, then the chargeback rate is very low. So, um, so, and then in that case, the, 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 the merchant, uh, are generally uh, speaking, uh, the merchant will get their fund uh, settled on next day, it's very quick. Um, that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, in in summary, that's a, a QR code payment um, is a very convenient and uh, fast and the secret payment system. Yeah, Martin. And I think also I would also add to that, Peter. In in today's COVID world, um, we all know everyone in the industry knows about just the explosion of, of contactless. Obviously, not only in Canada but but around the world but truly using a QR code because it's controlled by the consumer. There, there is, it's going one step further beyond contact because you don't even have to take a card out of the wallet. There's literally no, uh, no contact. And, and as you mentioned, it's also a uh, super secure transaction because of the multi layers of authentication. And uh, as we experienced through our merchant base, um, chargebacks uh, are virtually, uh, virtually non-existent in, in the definition of say a, a credit card. Uh, a credit card transaction. Is that, is that a fair statement to summarize what you just said? Yes, correct, 100%. Now, if, if you could just take a couple of minutes, Peter, and walk us through who qualifies to be able to use Chinese digital payment, um, WeChat, Alipay, or China Union Pay QR code. Would I be able to uh, use that? So, uh, so I think, the, at this moment, um, this Chinese digital payment, uh, which had to pay Alipay uh, for end user, so, um, for the consumer, uh, they has to open the Chinese bank account. At this moment, uh, I don't think uh, as a general, like, a, uh, like a you, uh, like a team, even me, I don't have Chinese bank account. So um, it's not possible to register your uh, bank card within the uh, this uh, right. WeChat by Alipay in the China Union Pay. So, but uh, I what I uh, know is uh, and they are working on that to add the uh, uh, foreigner bank the credit card into their payment system. And I believe I, I, I believe Visa has actually has actually cut a deal uh, for foreign visitors coming into China um, because of the uh, extreme digitalization of payment there and lack of cash uh, acceptance. So, uh, so thank you for that. So, with a really top line understanding of what the technology is, how it works, uh, how the interaction happens between uh, the consumers and its popularity in China, I'd like to bring it back uh, to make it a little more local. Uh, and talk about uh, what's the opportunity uh, is is in Canada. Um, and before we kind of get into that, um, and I may pull up a couple of slides to show you some numbers, but I want to just clear up a misconception uh, about what type of merchant benefits from the service. So basically, uh, who's in which type of merchant is interested in the service? It's any merchant uh, who sells or potentially sells to a Chinese consumer here. Or anywhere in the world, in the case of in the case of ecom, so it's not just for Chinese restaurants, Chinese grocery stores, bubble tea shops, those type of things. Leon's and the Brick accepts it. Air Canada accepts it. 
Burke accept, accepts it. A lot of tourist attractions accepts it. Again, it's basically when that Chinese consumer wants to spend, um, who's facilitating that transaction for them. So I want to just clear that up. Uh, or another way to think about it, think about all the brands in Yorkdale Mall car dealerships, car rentals, and I think I mentioned tourist attractions. It's really any merchant in Canada that caters to the to the Chinese consumer. So obviously a heavy concentration in Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, emerging in, in Calgary, but as in the case of Leon's and the Brick, they've rolled it out across the country. So again, it's, if a Chinese consumer comes in, uh, the preferred method of payment could be Alipay, WeChat Pay, or EPI uh, QR code. So I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Tim uh, to share with us some information uh, and what the market really looks like, who are the constituents, um, and uh, kind of walk us through how that applies to the Canadian marketplace. So, Tim, over to you. Thanks, Martin. So, now that we know some of the technical aspects of it and the power of digital payments, uh, especially with the QR code, you know, we've really worked on a lot of strategies with a lot of our merchants uh, to really identify uh, what the possibilities are and how to grow their market share. So not just in the English and French world, uh, it's really extending that to the Chinese community as well. As most of you uh, may or may not know, there are over two, point, over 2 million Chinese consumers in Canada. Um, and that's a mix between first generation, second generation or third generation. So for, again, just to level set. So first generation uh, are, are those that were not born in Canada. Second generation are those who at least one parent was born in uh, in Canada. And third generation means you were not born. In, you were you were born in Canada. So if you look at the total percentage, there's over seventy percent are still first generation. And if you see the marketing and all the brands who are targeting Chinese consumers today, whether you're watching on TV, whether you're searching on digital or social. A lot of brands are really targeting this Chinese consumer. And the reasons uh, are looking, look, just look at the numbers, right? So just if you look at the distribution of new immigrants to Canada um, and, and those who are, um, especially with new immigrants as well as, as international students, uh, they make up a very big percentage uh, of the total population today. But more importantly, the spending, the the wallet size, as uh, and as well as the transaction volumes that we've seen. So huge opportunity for a lot of brands to target the Chinese consumers and coming with as a new immigrant, you're still tied to a lot of your money from uh, your home country. Um, so Alipay, WeChat Pay, Union Pay are all digital wallets that are tied to the consumer's bank accounts, Chinese bank accounts. Um, and how it works in Canada is that these a lot of these uh, consumers are still using with it. It's their parents money who are transferring money over here for tuition um, to buy luxury cars to pay for rent. Uh, or just buying everyday items. Um, that that's part of the the convenience for them is not only are they using Canadian bank accounts, but they're also using their China bank accounts as well. Yeah, and maybe Tim, you could uh, talk to or Tim or Peter, you could talk to a little bit about how uh, some of the realities of coming out of China is the restrictions on how much actual cash you can take out and how allowing consumers to use uh, Alipay, WeChat Pay, or Union Pay gives them greater access to their cash back in China. Yeah, so the government rule is, uh, or China's rule, is that you can only um, bring in 50,000 US uh, into Canada uh, a year. Um, so that's their maximum allowance uh, that they can bring into the country. But this Alipay, WeChat Pay, and Union Pay spend doesn't go against that 50,000 US cap. So that's why we're seeing a lot of purchasing power, a lot of uh, expenditure. Um, so they can deposit that 50,000, they can use it for a down payment, they can use it for tuition or whatnot. But if they're using their China bank accounts, there's no cap against that. So that doesn't go against that allowable, which makes it a lot more convenient for them to move money into, and spend their, their China money in Canada. And, and so this, um, so a lot of what you're seeing on this slide here um, is really talking about uh, retail spend uh, from the consumer here. We've also talked earlier about how um, OTT Pay can take a merchant's brand uh, inside of the uh, difficult to penetrate intranet wall uh, in China. So you can actually have access to uh, consumers that are, are based in, in China. And I just wanted to put up another slide here to show you uh, some of those numbers. So I talked before about people that are using WeChat, the social program, uh, to go in and do their, their daily daily lives, but when then they're in the, in the consume, these are the pure numbers that 
if we bring a merchant's brand into China, this is potentially who could be looking at their um, at their uh, at their at their website. Tim, maybe you can walk uh, through some of these numbers. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the the biggest um, restrictions in China, as everybody knows, is Google and Facebook. So those two platforms are banned in China. So you know a lot of these consumers are can't, aren't even allowed to use Facebook. So the only way they can interact on the digital and social level is using WeChat um, as a as a communication tool as well as a, a payment platform. So everything that they do is on the WeChat platform. Same with Alipay and same with Union Pay. So these are purely communication. Uh, we would say the biggest um, the biggest advantage of WeChat is really their social and digital platforms. Um, that's the, their bread and butter isn't the payment side of things. Their bread and butter, which brings in a lot of revenue, is really the marketing aspect of it. And you'll see a lot of brands using uh, WeChat as a platform now, whether it's an official account, uh, using WeChat mini programs to drive e-commerce. Uh, they're really using leveraging this platform to target the Chinese consumers, not just in locally, which you can, but also overseas. Um, so if you want to target someone before they come into Canada, you can also do that. So a lot of brands who, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, pre-COVID, we were we were targeting a lot of consumers uh, before they arrived, uh, geo-targeting based on their preferences and interests, uh, and especially with vacationing and tourism. So that was a big endeavor, uh, even at the, re at the retail level. We were able to geo-target a lot of ch uh, Chinese consumers before they come to Canada and they're planning to visit. Um, so that we know they love shopping. They love shopping at luxury brands. So you know we're able to geo-target them using these platforms to really drive home the message as well as promotions and offers as well. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a very a very important point. <clears throat> Excuse me. And while um, anybody any merchant can make their own internal decision as part of their marketing strategy to penetrate the Chinese market, it can be done. But it's a highly specialized skill. Um, to to get it in there. Uh, so as an example, um, you have to have an official WeChat account. And correct me if I'm wrong, Tim. I think I think unless you know what you're doing, that can take up to 12 months just to even get that established. Is that am I correct on that? Yeah, because it's owned by Tencent, which is the parent company of WeChat. Uh, there's a lot of uh, restrictions. Uh, there's category restrictions. There's a lot of documentation. Everything's communicated to the ten, uh, the China office uh, to get approvals. Uh, so it is a very tedious. Uh, process. Um, so we have an in-house team that does all that for our clients. Uh, we've met, not only do we set up the official account, we do all the pay we help with all the paperwork. We do all the communications. There's a 12 hour difference as well. Um, and also uh, more importantly, we also do all the planning and, and content uh, management for them. So it's just like any other channel, whether you're using Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn, you know, content is king. You have to be relevant to your consumer. You have to be able to articulate authentically uh, what your product means to them and what you bring to the table. So uh, you know, WeChat, of, WeChat is the platform is no different than uh, your LinkedIn, your, your company's LinkedIn profile. You definitely want to have a, a clear branding presence, uh, but more importantly, be authentic and how to engage with this target audience. Because if at the end of the day, this, these channels are very lucrative. Uh, within the WeChat platform, there are many different ways that you can communicate. They have videos, they have content, they have influencers. Everything is done on these channels that we can we can help leverage, um, and I'll talk to you about a bit that, about more about that in right. some of our case studies. Okay, great, thank you. So, um, again, we've got the we talked a little bit about localizing it in terms of who are the constituents that uh, we appeal to in Canada. Uh, and there's basically four of them. There's your um, Chinese tourists, obviously impacted with COVID. Uh, we have there's a very large number of Chinese uh, students that come here. Many stay here year round, and many um, end up uh, settling in Canada after. Again, impact uh, uh, on on COVID there uh, as well. We have our um, our Canadian citizen, uh, sorry, Chinese Canadian citizen community who obviously live here year round uh, and consume. And then the fourth. Uh, group is the group that we can take you into China uh, and and take your take your brand to and you saw some of those uh, some of those usage numbers uh, up there. Couple that with the fact that their preferred method to consume is to use the payment types that we uh, that we talked about. One other uh, valuable le valuable lesson that I learned that it really help, helps to illustrate just how powerful uh, Alipay, WeChat Pay, and UPI are in China. The way 
myself as a Westerner recognizes Visa, MasterCard, Amex, and in Canada, the Interact brand, the same level of recognition, probably higher because of their ties into the social um, platform programs, the brand recognition of Alipay, WeChat Pay, and UPI in China is more recognizable than what I uh, uh, recognize with uh, Visa and MasterCard. And um, so to kind of give an example of that, if I was in China uh, right now with my family and I had limited amount of Chinese um, uh, currency on me and it was lunchtime and we were hungry and I looked around knowing that Chinese, uh, that China is going cashless. There are kids in China today that have never handled cash. Um, it's like merchants selling food on the streets have got a QR code that they take payments with. So I'm looking around. I don't have a WeChat account. I don't have an Alipay account. Um, limited cash in my pocket. If I looked around and I saw a restaurant with a Visa logo on it, my comfort level goes up as a consumer. Language barriers come down. I have uh, kind of unlimited access to funds. So flip that on its head and imagine uh, a, new, a newly arriving Chinese person here, a Chinese consumer, a Chinese student, uh, looking around and then seeing that Alipay, WeChat Pay logo, our UPI logo they recognize. Their comfort level comes up and it could be a draw for them to, uh, to come into your store. So um, I think we've established uh, just how big the market can be. Uh, we've established it's, it's a specialized um, skill set to to cater to this uh, specific market, something that, that we do uh, that we do offer. Why don't we talk uh, take a few minutes and talk a little bit about, okay, that's great, uh, OTT pay. Uh, I represent merchants or I am a merchant. Um, I've got existing technology in my store which accepts Visa, MasterCard, and Interact. How do, what do I got to do to um, implement, implement this? So um, there's basically three or four different ways that can be done. And I'm going to ask Peter to kind of walk through everything from just your static QR code through to integrating with existing e-com platforms. So Peter, if you can walk us through the three or four different ways that we can uh, help a merchant get established to actually accept a, a WeChat, Alip, or UPI. So, uh, uh, so all the WeChat pay, Alip, and uh, UPI, so all our digital um, QR codes based payment, they typically they offer the four different way to integrate it. One, what is it called the static QR code? It's easier for the uh, uh, very small, uh, like a, a street food vendor. So they will see, okay, they will present a QR code, a static QR code. Then the uh, customer will use a digital wallet to scan this QR code, then type in the payment, then it will, will We'll, uh, we'll see the when the payment proceeds, then the phone will display the uh, display the payment complete uh, uh, status. Well, we we also offer the uh, the customer uh, merchant uh, app. The app will receive a notification where the payment is success. Then that's the easiest way. Uh, what we call static QR code. Doesn't require any uh, any device, anything. It's just a, a, a app. So a uh, second way uh, is uh, for the like a uh, uh, big big store like a uh, like a super, uh, supermarket. So we will have um, a device. We will have an Android-based device, all integrated with the existing payment device. So uh, um, we'll display the QR code uh, on this device. Then um, the customer can use a digital payment, uh, digital wallet to scan this QR code because this QR code is uh, connecting with the uh, post. When the code post, um, uh, when the cashier typing the uh, amount, then the uh, dynamic QR code will be generated and displayed on the device. Then customer use uh, um, the digital wallet to scan the payment. Then uh, the payment once the payment finish, the acknowledged information uh, will be received, will be displayed, and notified to the post. Um, this uh, requires some uh, some uh, um, small amount of technical uh, integration work with the existing uh, post system. Uh, third way we will call is generally uh, e-com in the e-com world. E-com world uh, because um, if 
you, uh, your e-com uh, showing on the PC website. The PC website, is, uh, it will be similar to the uh, um, dynamic, dynamic QR code displayed in supermarket uh, scenario. So a dynamic QR code will be displayed on a web page. Then the customer scan, uses their phone to scan this QR code to proceed this payment. Um, so the first way is uh, uh, what we call is uh, in app. So your um, e-com website is is e-com app. So uh, it's a payment. It's it's a uh, it's a app. It's a, a Android app, Android app, or the iPhone app. So because the wallet, then in this case, the customer cannot scan the QR code because right. So because the the app is running already running on smartphone, so we will provide the SDK. So the customer, uh, so the payment app, the, the uh, e-com app, will through this SDK will call our payment um, our payment module to invoke the uh, to send a message to the digital wallet payment. Then the digital wallet, the payment behind the scene, uh, will, uh, will send the payment information to the uh, payment processor and uh, send back the uh, uh, payment uh, confirmation information and then payment proceed. In, in this case, there's no QR code uh, displayed in anywhere. But uh, in uh, this one, this uh, in all of this uh, payment method, there's uh, one thing so because uh, we had payment, we had pay or other pay. Uh, the one is a social media platform. Another one is a big Chinese uh, number one uh, uh, e-com platform. That's uh, they have huge amount of user base. So the payment information basically once you get this payment information, there's um, we can. Behind the scenes, there, so we can push the information to the uh, to, to the the customer will receive this information can can display can recommend I uh, can push their uh, their see they can put the see recommend your product in in their social network. So that's why we see this is a very powerful tools combine these two together. It's not only payment. Tools, but also the marketing tools. Thanks, Peter. So there was actually a specific question that came up on the uh, uh, in the chat group. Someone was asking, "Do I need a dedicated piece of hardware to accept?" Uh, and the answer is, it, it depends. So we're flexible, um, as, as Peter said. It can be everything. We can actually have a merchant up and running in a couple of days by putting a static QR code on the attached to the cash register. Uh, and then basically what that does, it turns the, it turns the consumer's phone uh, into the POS machine. And while using myself as an example, I probably don't have a high comfort level doing that because I've never done it before. But again, for the Chinese consumer, uh, through their experience, it's, uh, it's very common for them to do that. So everything through our own standalone devices or an integration or a plug-in, we work with Shopify and some of the other uh, leading e-com uh, to, to do the processing. Um, the other thing we should point out is that we have partnerships with uh, with the most of the major processors in Canada, uh, different levels of partnership. But one particular processor, we actually have our application integrated, uh, so it sits beside their payment app. So it really, it, it could you could leverage your existing uh, hardware from your uh, from your processor. In the case of processors who have Android devices out there, we have our app sitting in there. Uh, in their store, they can download it. So, long answer to your question, but it's we're extremely flexible uh, in in how we implement this integrations, which can sometimes be scary when you throw that out there. They're not as uh, uh, encompassing as as in the Western payment world. It's weeks rather than months to do it. So, uh, we can do a, a deeper dive into that if you want to reach out to us, uh, reach out to us directly. So. We've kind of covered off, uh, covered off technology. We covered off the background. We covered off that there's a that there's a market um, uh, available for us uh, out there. Uh, Tim had talked a little bit about some of the specific marketing services that we offer. Um, I'm just looking at the clock here, and I do want to get to some of the use cases. But uh, there's much more to these marketing services. Uh, we did uh, rather than just throw out some slides of what they are. It's better if we talk to you directly about it. But 
the point I want to emphasize is that they're highly specialized to work within the work within the, the, the Chinese uh, methodology in terms of how things are done. We have all that in house uh, that we offer as part of our as part of our services. So, what I'd like to do is, is is kind of start to tie it all together and show you some examples of um, some actual uh, case studies that that, that we've done. Um, so I'm going to just pull up a couple more slides here, and then I'm going to turn it over to Tim uh, to kind of walk you through some real life examples of what's uh, happening in here. I think also is we've talked a lot about it from the perspective of a processing of a transaction where the consumer comes in, does a face to face transaction, or does an e-com transaction, similar checkout to when we use a Visa or Mastercard. Uh, Tim will also touch on another area that we have expertise and a lot of success in. Uh, in the area of things like e-vouchers. Uh, again, leveraging off of advertising and selling this to the Chinese community, but it's also part of the platform offering that, that we're getting a lot of interest from the retail community on. So Tim, give me one second and I'll pull up the slide. Um, so why don't we start with uh, this one, Tim? Yeah, sounds good. So as Martin alluded to, we, ha we work with over 4,000 merchants in Canada, large, small enterprise, um, but one of our big, pilots that we did was for SO, uh, for Imperial. So SO mobile gas stations. So six months ago, we launched a pilot of uh, 25, identified 25 locations uh, in high density Chinese neighborhoods in BC and Ontario to accept OTT pay. So um, that means that any Chinese consumer that wanted to use uh, WeChat Pay, Alipay, uh, Union Pay was able to pay for their gas, pay for their, uh, Anything that they want in the convenience store as well, uh, car wash, whatnot, they can. They were able to scan the QR code and to uh, use their Chinese digital wallets of preference to pay for their fuel or anything inside the convenience store. So our six month uh, pilot was a very big success. Uh, and based on our assumptions, uh, we, you know, Chinese consumers as a hypothesis, we know that they buy luxury cars. So one of the hypo hypotheses was that, uh, will they be using premium gas, right? And using Chinese digital walls to pay for that premium gas, which is a higher uh, transaction volume. So, you know, evidently, you know, we definitely proved that within the six months that over 50% of our transaction volumes were, were made on buying premium gas. So, you know, it was a very successful pilot. Um, as of June 1st, which was only a couple of days ago, we launched nationally uh, across Canada. So every SO mobile and mobile gas station across Canada, 2,100 locations now accept OTT pay. We were we have um, sticker signage at the POS. Uh, all our QR codes uh, are, are are also just been um, put up by all the attendants uh, by all the gas stations. So if you walk into any SO gas station now or mobile gas station, you will see our QR code stickers as well as at the pump, um, you will see some collateral as well. So on top of that, no, that's great. So how do we get people to how to get how to get this awareness out? So you know we work with our partners um, to really broadcast this to our WeChat Pay as well as our Union Pay consumers users because they're they're the benefactors of this. So you know we've developed a, a lot of digital social influencer campaigns uh, and mass media to really complement this launch to really drive home um, that this is available at all the gas stations. So. This is just another channel that so a national brand like uh, Imperial that is willing to invest in this type of uh, platform to really drive home and uh, inc and to deliver incremental uh, revenue uh, based on this Chinese consumer. Yeah, I think I, I would also just add to this. You can uh, again, you can see the use of the of the sticker as as essentially turning the phone into the point of the point of sale machine. So not a ton of integration uh, on that side. I'd also add that. Um, a lot of the infrastructure building around this program uh, was done and owned by uh, OTT Pay. Again, we have the infrastructure to do a lot of this customization uh, work on our own. Obviously, it's leverageable for other merchants to use the same the same platform. So all of this is is in house, and as well as the uh, the campaigning to, to drive the demand was also uh, uh, in house in house as well. And I think I mentioned earlier on in the presentation that. Again, if you look at if you look at a population map, very high concentration um, of the Chinese community in BC, Greater Vancouver area, obviously the GTHL, Ontario, uh, Quebec, and I mentioned that Calgary is starting to starting to grow. Um, but this was um, so obviously, and Tim mentioned this was very successful in those areas. But still, ESO decided to roll it out 
uh, to the entire country because they recognize that the Chinese consumer is across the country and not just inside of those three geographic locations that I uh, that I kind of uh, I kind of talked to. Um, a question has just come up. I think I'd like to answer it now rather than leave it to the end. And and it was: Do consumers bear the cost of AliPay, WeChat, or, or does AliPay, WeChat? Script. Does the consumer bear the cost, or does AliPay, WeChat Pay bear the cost? I'm going to talk. To, I'll talk to the merchant side of it, and then I'll ask Peter and or Timothy to comment on uh, what the costing is like on the consumer on the consumer side. So on the merchant side of the business, um, the costing is um, not unlike. Uh, Western payments. Uh, it's basically there's, there's there's an interchange rate uh, that, that we have to incur, uh, and then there's a margin that any processor put on top of it, and it's a variable amount. So it's a percentage that the uh, that the merchant uh, pays for if there's a need to rent point of sale machines, those type of things um, are all there. We any integration costs in that we'd have to look on a case by case basis, but uh, because it's simpler than doing it in the Western space, uh, th those costs are, are nominal. So the key cost to the merchant is a percent per transaction. Uh, ballpark figures, those percentages tend to be lower than Western uh, Western payments uh, for a couple couple reasons. Interchange um, from our partners at Alipay, WeChat Pay, and UPI uh, tend to be lower on on the on the brick and mortar on the brick and mortar side. Also, the total cost of the transaction, when you start to add in retrieval, chargeback, fraud monitoring, that is, uh, again, virtually non-existent because you don't have the same fraud exposure. So the total cost of running these programs tends to be uh, lower than running a, uh, say, a Visa MasterCard uh, program. So on the consumer side, Peter, Tim, maybe you could add in some comments about uh, is there a per transaction fee to the consumer, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll hand it over to you. Uh, consumer uh, does not bear any cost to use RDP, which had to pay. Yeah, so it's really just a payment platform that they, they use as a wallet. So there's no cost to the consumer. It's really just convenience for them uh, to be able to select and choose which payment option best fits their needs. Yeah, and the, the last uh, piece I would just add to that before we move on to the next slide is, um, you should also know that the consumer experience is that the while the merchant is showing them Canadian dollars, the consumer is seeing it in their local currency. But obviously, whatever the, the merchant charges, say it's ten dollars and twenty five cents, that's what gets settled to the merchant's account. Um, but there is there is some foreign exchange that happens in between the the uh, merchant and the consumer. But again, that's all transparent to the uh, to the merchant. So what I'll do now is I'll move on to uh, another example. Um, of, uh, of a real life implementation uh, that we've had um, that Tim can, Tim can walk us through. Yeah, so uh, one of our big industries is obviously retail. Uh, even with the shutdown of COVID, uh, a lot of malls have been closed for a good part of the year. Um, we've actually developed a lot of online tools as well as e-commerce e-vouchers uh, for our, our mer larger merchants. So, you know, not only are we developing uh, mini programs on the e-commerce level, but also developing uh, using our own platforms. We have our own uh, web apps to the, to sell e-vouchers, which are pretty much equivalent to e-gift cards uh, for a lot of our uh, bigger merchants like Ivanhoe Cambridge, Cadillac Fairview, Oxford, uh, Rio Can. So a lot of our uh, big merch retail merchants are looking at the online side to buy gift cards. So even though Western uh, in Western Canada, a lot of malls are still open and are still open when Canada, when Ontario was in lockdown, a lot of our sales on the e-com level was really focused on out West. And those numbers didn't even, they, they matched what we did last year uh, in 2019, as well as in 2020. So there's no slowdown. Uh, COVID definitely made people eager to spend more money because they've probably saved more money as well. Uh, but our e-voucher, e our e-gift program did very well in the last year and it continues to expand um, to, to, to really drive uh, sales for our larger retailers. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, it, again, if you remember, our constituents were tourists, uh, students, um, uh, local Chinese uh, Canadians and, and obviously access into uh, consumers in, in, in China. But the, uh, we lost the tourists and we lost a lot of the student um, volume, um, and yet uh, our 
net net over last year, our business really didn't take an impact, and it was that was clearly driven by um, by ecom. Uh, so that's an important distinction uh, to make. Um, I'd like to just move on to uh, another slide here, Tim. If you can walk us through our experience. Yeah. So another industry that's been hit pretty hard uh, is our attractions. Um, so we work with a lot of um, most of the biggest attractions in Canada, AGO, ROM, Ripley, CN Tower, Canada's Wonderland. Um, you know, they've been hit hard because there's no tourists um, coming into Canada and they've been closed all this time. So what we've actually done uh, as an innovative solution is to create these destination passes. So the OTT destination pass is really working with our OTT pay merchants to come up with a, a package so that a consumer can, and these are really tailored to the existing Chinese consumers in, uh, locally, uh, these more, more like a staycation. Um, so they can buy a gift package and they can have two tickets to go to the ROM. They can have two tickets to go to Wonderland, CN Tower, eat at the 360 restaurant. So these are larger ticket volume packages, uh, which we know this Chinese consumer is willing to pay, but it also gives them an experience, right? Not just tickets to uh, entry tickets uh, because they're paying higher volume, higher dollar transaction numbers. They're getting the parking, they're getting the uh, front of the line pass, they're getting food, they're getting, you know, uh, all the, all to cater around the experiences, what they're used to and what they're used to paying as well. So we've been curating packages uh, across the GTA as well in the, in the GVA. Uh, we're working with a lot of our Niagara merchants as well as our retailers to include gift cards as part of that. So this is all online. This is all through our proprietary e-voucher platform uh, on our consumer app as well as on our web app. So they can buy a package and, and we're happy to work with other merchants to include them in this destination pass not only selling to local uh, locally, but also once the borders open again and when visitors will start flowing back in next year, uh, we will definitely be seeing a big uptake on these uh, because there is a big value. There is some discounting and it also drives the ticket size a lot higher than what you would normally pay. Yeah, I think that's a valid point. And we, uh, Tim and his team recently met with Niagara Tourism uh, and with a bundled package here, uh, with one of our one of our mall partners as well. As, uh, again, we pivoted and focused very much on the staycation, and there's a lot of there's a lot of demand there. But in all the discussions with our partners, Niagara Tourism, Toronto Tourism, Kingston Tourism, Montreal Tourism, everyone is moving into the prepare to reopen mode. Um, it's anyone's guess when that's going to happen, but three months, six months, seven months, and so we're all pre also preparing to take some of these packages inside of China to uh, preemptively sell it to the tourists who's making their decision to come back to uh, Toronto next year or this winter. And we would offer these bundled packages as, as part of that uh, as part of that offering. Um, but the, the transaction size tends to be huge. Uh, the, the notion the notion of a destination pass, again, this is just this is just one example of some of the things that uh, some of the things that we we can bundle. Uh, it could be a mall. It could be a mall pass, or I mean, it could be anything that our merchant base wants. Because we do everything in house uh, and leverage a lot of um, our e voucher platform, that um, our proprietary e voucher platform that Peter's Group has built, uh, we can design something uh, any way uh, that that people that people want. The other comment I wanted to make too was. From where we're talking to tier one retailers, um, part of what we focus on is that, particularly during COVID, um, having the ability to target one specific group uh, all of a sudden becomes more important when everyone is struggling to get any any type of sale. And the response has been pretty positive. Uh, and part of what we also tell them is that uh, because we have relationships with Oxford, Cadillac, Fairview, um, Ivanhoe, um, they're they're using uh, uh, Chinese digital payments to allow the Chinese consumer to buy a mall gift card, um, whether it's e-voucher or whether they physically go to the kiosk. Now malls are closed right now, but prior to prior to COVID, was we would see huge spikes uh, in processing volumes around every one of the Chinese um, kind of uh, cultural based. Um, celebrations and a lot of them don't coincide with the traditional bumps in the western side and western so no we have christmas we have mother's day we have easter but there's a lot of our cultural festivals tied to chinese community uh that, that drive spikes in volume and we would see a massive influx into the mall so we're telling the the tenants of the mall chinese consumers are shopping you just don't see it because they may be using a card 
uh, a mall card or a mall gift card. And that tends to tweak, tweak their volume, uh, tweak, tweak their interest. So we think there's way more pent up demand that once acceptance starts to increase at the store level, we'll start to see volumes grow even more. Um, I'm getting the five minute uh, war warning. Um, I, and I think we've answered most of the questions. Uh, oh, actually, sorry, there's one more question we haven't answered. Let, let me just address it. The question is, how do we exchange, how do we control the exchange risk by the time the consumer taps and the transaction actually occurs? It could be the rate can differ. So on the merchant side, there is no risk. The mer whatever the merchant, merchant charges, the merchant gets. On the consumer side, um, the consumer understands that there is going to be a, a perhaps a difference uh, in the settlement amount. Um, so there's a lot of magic that goes on behind around the foreign exchange. Um, OTT Financial, as an example, our parent company, uh, deals in a lot of that. But Peter, maybe in, in 30 seconds or so, if you can walk through um, how that risk is managed. What I can tell you is that the offering that we end up doing on behalf of the consumer tends to be more favorable than what other people would offer. So Peter, I'll hand it over to you. So whatever the uh, the, uh, the the merchant that labeled the uh, goods, so they will get that. So the, the customer, because when they paid from the digital wallet, then at that moment, there's an exchange rate. So for that exchange rate, um, we hide that, or RDP, we had to hide that exchange rate at that moment. So there's no risk uh, for any party. Basically, what the consumer the merchant sees the 1025 Canadian, they get that. The consumer sees X, X amount on their phone, and that's exactly what they're charged. So there is no lag. It's what, what they see on their phone and what they agree to is what they're actually charged. Um, I'm, getting the, uh, I'm getting the flag here. So I think we're down to maybe one or two minutes. Um, I've put our contact information up there um, for everybody. If you have any other questions or need more information, please contact one of us. Uh, directly if we can't answer the question we'll certainly get it for you uh in the last couple of minutes uh, i just wanted to uh thank everybody again for investing some of your time in this and thank again um uh payments canada and this as well as the uh my uh, fellow pa fellow uh panel uh attendees uh hopefully we've hopefully we've shared enough information with you that you can you can spread the word or if you've piqued enough interest that you want us to uh, to follow up with you, but it is a very, very, the Chinese community is a very powerful group. Selling to uh, specific ethnic groups is a trend that's coming. Fall very closely behind Chinese digital payment. WeChat Pay, Alipay is Rupay, uh, which caters towards the um, East Indian community. Again, similar story in terms of what they're used to doing. We have a large East Indian community in Canada. Um, and again, as part of, uh, you know, we view ourselves as, as a merchant processor. Um, so that may be a market we decide to get into somewhere down the road. But right now, we have the Chinese community. We know how to sell to them. They buy from us. They trust us. They trust our brand. They trust our name. And we're hoping to work with some of you in attendance uh, to see how, what kind of partnership that we can uh, perform. Before we close off, Peter and Tim, do you have any uh, last comments to make? No. Uh, no, I think that, I think uh, 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 there's a lot of information here uh, for sure. And uh, we just want to emphasize that there is a big market. Uh, it, it's, a, it, it, it's not a one size fits all. Uh, it has to be strategically placed. Uh, there is a lot of opportunities to grow market share. There's a lot of opportunities, especially when the borders open again, tourism, uh, um, to really extend your brands and to 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 attract this uh, consumer to to purchase your products or and services. So, we definitely would welcome any conversations. If you need any uh, more case studies, proof points, uh, do reach out to myself, Martin, or Peter. We'd be happy to have uh, separate conversations to discuss uh, what what your objectives are and how we can help. Great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I have to cut everybody off there. We're under the minute mark, and I think if I don't be quiet, they're just going to cut me off anyway. So thank you again, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the uh, rest of the show, and hopefully we'll be seeing everybody in, in person. Thanks again for your time. Take care. Music